Hey, good morning, folks. It's great to see you, especially those who are in the hall with us, but for those who are not, stand in front of your TVs and let's sing together, God is for us. We won't fear the battle, we won't fear the night, we will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us, you will lead the way, we have found a refuge and only you can say. Sing with joy now, our God is for us, the Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. celebrating communion there's nothing more important in the life of the church I believe for the foundation of our faith is Jesus death and resurrection and if we didn't have that we would have nothing Paul tells us that our faith would be in vain let's sing together oh praise the name I cast my mind to Calvary Jesus led and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and dressed in tears. They laid him
At break of dawn. Hallelujah, the sun. sun
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our church service. It's a pleasure to see you here in the building, and I know for those of you that are at home, I'm glad that you're watching as well. Uh, it's, been, it's always an encouragement each week to see faces that I haven't seen in a long time, uh, people who are coming out new uh, since the pandemic seems to be waning a bit, and also visitors from El Salvador. We're thankful <laughs> for you as well. Um, as we come together this morning, to worship our great and mighty God, let's take a moment to reflect on just how great and mighty he is and how frail we are by comparison. Let's remember as we do that he's not distant, he's not uncaring, but that he knows us and he cares about us. So listen to the words of the prophet Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 40. All people are like grass. And their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord, the word of our God, endures forever. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him. And his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. And he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket? Or weighed the mountains and the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Why do you complain? Why do you say, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and even young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. 
this morning as we worship our God. Let's remember that he is the God who reigns over the whole world, over all peoples, all nations, including ours, as we sing uh, O Canada at the beginning of the service. Please stand. the second verse because it puts the focus where I believe it should be on God who is the ruler of all ruling all of the nations whether they submit to him or not and we serve a great God who's done great things let's stay standing as we sing this song together
Amen. You can be seated for a moment. So I have a few announcements before we go into the pastoral prayer. Um, we do have a family event coming up uh, July 10th at 10 a.m., uh, 10 a.m. till noon. If you want to come with your kids, Woodbine Beach Park, that's behind the Tim Hortons down there, uh, and we'll have some activities and sort of social distanced fun uh, with some family stuff uh, that morning. Uh, that's July 10th coming up. Um, we also have the, you saw the email, I'm sure, our deacon uh, election is completed, and um, Mark Diker and David Power were brought in, uh, David to continue as a deacon, and Mark for a first time, and we're very thankful to them, and for Alistair, who finished his term and, and uh, didn't have his name stand again, so thank you to those three men and all the rest who are serving as deacons at this time of the church. We appreciate you very much. Uh, if you're interested in the uh, outreach, uh, things that we've been um, talking about into Little India, and with the... Um, the, the Zoom meetings with Dominic Jacobs, who's going to come and talk to us about uh, reaching out to people of different faiths. Um, let Mark know you want to attend. That's going to be at July 8th, um, so that's coming up soon. So make sure that you guys uh, let Mark know about that. Um, and then finally, just as a reminder that offering uh, is an act of worship. We give our monies to the Lord, and I uh, just want to remind you that you can do that um, by mailing a check in by putting it in the box at the back, and by doing it through an e-transfer to donation at forwardbaptist.com. So, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Almighty God, King Supreme over all the world, we pray to you together today, and we lift up your name on high. We acknowledge you as our King and our God. We pledge our utmost allegiance to you above any nation or ruler. We thank you for our nation, the dominion of Canada. We praise you for making this land our home, whether it's our native land or our adopted land. We thank you for uh, those who you have uh, raised up to govern this land. We ask that you would endow them with justice and righteousness, as your Psalms say. Oh God, that they would judge in right, righteousness and care for the needy and afflicted. Uh, they will bring the, the afflicted to justice or bring justice to the afflicted, I should say. We pray that they would uh, define justice and righteousness based on your standards and your word. We pray that you would move in their lives so that they would know you, you through your son. They'd be born again by your spirit, put their faith in Christ and be saved from their sins. We pray that in aligning with your justice and righteousness, their leadership would bring prosperity to the people and the fruit of righteousness to the nation that they would defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy and overturn the oppressor. May their leadership be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth, refreshing the nation so that righteousness flourishes and prosperity abounds. Lord Jesus, we ask that our nation would recognize that you are the one who has dominion from sea to sea and over all the world. We ask that all nations, not just ours, would come under your reign and bow down to you and serve you, for you will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. You will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. You will rescue them from oppression and violence, for their blood is precious in your sight. King Jesus, we acknowledge here today that it isn't just our nation or the world that rejects your reign. We, your children, do so every day. We confess that this week and even this morning we have sinned and wandered from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the ways and desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. We have left undone those things that we should, not have, should have done. We have done those things that we should not have done. There's no true goodness in us without you. And so, God, we pray, have mercy on us who are sinners. Have mercy on us according to your promises declared to mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And for his sake, strengthen us to live godly, righteous, and joyful lives to the glory of your holy name. As we take communion later uh, this morning, Lord, that we would remember these, this truth of the gospel, that we are sinners who have been saved, and that we would continue to live in repentance as we remember Christ. 
We pray, Lord, that you would use us as your ambassadors to proclaim your kingdom to the world so that they may turn to you and be saved. We pray that you would give us boldness and opportunity to share the gospel to our neighbors and coworkers and classmates and friends and families. We ask that your Holy Spirit would open their eyes to your truth so that they can accept it and turn to Christ and be made new. We pray that you would save 10 people this year through our evangelism. At least, we know you can do so much more. We, we, we specifically, we pray for as we go into little India to share the gospel there, that you would dis- bless that endeavor for your glory. We pray, Lord, for our pastors and staff and interns and elders and deacons, especially our new deacon, uh, that you would bless and protect these men and women and, uh, we, as we seek to serve the church and to lead your people. Again, Lord, we pray for Mark uh, as he steps into his role as a deacon in the next few weeks. We pray that, and we pray for our church Lord, for those who are recovering from surgeries and for those who are suffering, we ask that you would give comfort and peace and joy to us. Finally, we look forward to the day when when Christ, when you return to fully reign over the world and make all things new, doing away with sickness and death and sin and sorrow forever. We pray that you would come quickly, Lord Jesus. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus, our Savior and our Lord and our King. Amen. Coming through, coming through, excuse me. Whoa, mister! No budding! I need to ask Jesus something. I have something more important to ask the good teacher. You need to get in line. You think you're all special or something? Well, actually, now that you mention it, I am. Because I am the rich, the young, the rich, young ruler. And among you, All of you, I am quite super. For I'm not, definitely not, some unsung loser. For I know the law from the best tongue tutors. I have boats, I have camels, I have goats and many apples. The one thing I must obtain is eternity itself. It was far I have traveled on ship and on saddle to find you a good teacher and put eternity on my shelf. So tell me the secret. I see that you see it. I'll give you anything for I have great wealth. Why do you call me good? No one is good but God. Sir, I listen with great eagerness. Well, you know the commands. All of them I've kept since I was a boy. Still, one thing you'd lack. What's that? O rich, O young, O rich young ruler, your riches indeed are like a drunk stupor. For the law cannot secure the good future. For all, yes all, have countless bloopers. I don't desire oats or apples, no need for goats or incense candles. To enter eternity is hard for one of great wealth. Indeed, it's easier for people to put a camel through a needle than this rich man to gain eternity itself. I'll tell you the secret, you better believe it. Give all that you have to the poor and deny yourself. Oh rich, oh young, oh rich young ruler. Those who know the way are far and fewer. But Rabbi, who can be saved? What's impossible with man is possible with God. We have left all we had to follow you. Truly, I tell you, no one who has done such a great sacrifice will fail to receive many times as much and in the age to come, eternal life. Whoa! But understand, the Son of Man must be mocked, spit on, and delivered over to death, and then rise again.
People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. A certain ruler asked them, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we have had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, No man who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. May the Lord add his blessing. Hi. So, I'll start with the story. The Bible story. There we go. So, the prophet Samuel, he found himself in Jesse's house with seven of his sons. One of his seven sons would be God's chosen. Jesse brought forth his first son and said, who else but him? But the Lord rejected him. So then he brought his second son. Um, if not my first, naturally it would be the second. And again, the Lord rejected him. This continued on and on until all seven sons were rejected. Is there no one else? Jesse responded, I mean, well, there, I mean, there, there's my youngest. He's, he's out about in the field. We'll go get him. And young David approached. He was just a child, just, just a boy. But God said, this is the one. And so Samuel anointed him, and he would one day become the king of Jerusalem. And the key phrase in this story is, is 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, when it says, people look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, in the stories that we're going through in our message today, there, there's a similar contrast to the disciples' shock, and I think the disciples are like a shoe-in for, for the expected response. To the, to the disciples' shock, Jesus receives the little children. And to the disciples' surprise, Jesus rejects the rich young ruler. 
And the big question I have for, for all of us today is, and for us to learn, is why does Jesus, why does Jesus reject the rich young ruler but receive the little children? I'm going to start with the first story, rich young ruler, or the second story, and then I'm going to backtrack. So the rich young ruler is a pretty famous story. Uh, he's found in three accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And yet for all its familiarity, it's, it's kind of unsettling, right? I mean, he's everything society says is good. He's rich, he's young, he rules. In fact, as icing on the cake, he's a law-abiding citizen. If not him, who else? And yet, he doesn't enter the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't get the gospel. He's not saved. And it seems it's not in spite of his wealth, but it's because of his wealth. This is unsettling. I mean, there are some of us in this church who are very nice, very wealthy people. There are some of us in this church who aspire to be wealthy. And I don't know about you, but I like money. It's rather useful. What's Jesus saying? Well, and another question then becomes in my mind is, another challenge is, will riches borrow us from entering the kingdom of heaven? Well, let's look at this encounter. It's in verse 18. Verse 18, it says... Luke chapter 18, verse 18. Uh, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the question, it's, it's sincere enough, right? I mean, this is what every believer wants, eternal life. And in Mark's account, it says that he even uh, goes to Jesus' feet. It seems good. But watch how Jesus almost blows him off. Verse 19. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Now, at one level, Jesus is just deflecting flattery. No surface level compliments are going to get into his good books. At a deeper level, Jesus is saying, no one is good. A rich young ruler, you are already asking the wrong question. It's not about what I must, oh, what must, what must I do? It's not about what you must do. There's nothing we can do. It, no one is good. It, in Isaiah 64, verse 6, it says, all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. And yet at the deepest level, Jesus is saying, no one is good except God. A rich young ruler, I am inviting you to reflect on your own words because you have spoken better than you know. Just think about it. If, if, if no one is good except God, and yet you say, I am good, what does that mean? And so do you see how Jesus already sets the stage before the conversation begins? The underlying reality is here's this rich man who's taking his filthy rags, which is filled with blood, dirt, and guck, and he's taking it to a plate. He's going before God, the only person who can cleanse him of his sin, and he's saying, look at me, look how I'm cleaning my plate. Of course, all of this just flies over the head of the rich young ruler, and so, so, so Jesus really has to spell it out for him. And he starts in, in verse 20. He says, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. If anyone does an honest assessment of these commandments, they would know that they haven't kept them. Have I ever lied? Well, I did tell my parents my report card was missing when I was younger, so yeah. Um, have I ever stolen ice cream Oreo cookies? Yeah. Have I ever uh, committed lust or murder in my heart? Yeah. I mean, that was the point of the law, to reveal, to expose of, uh, us of our sin. 
Romans 3.20 says, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But the rich young ruler, still oblivious, blurts out in verse 21, all these things I've kept since I was a boy. And he's dead serious. He's sincere. He's so sincere, but he's sincerely wrong, right? And, I mean, perhaps he's kept the law better than most people. I mean, that confidence has to count for something. But if anything, it works to his disadvantage because now he's under the huge presumption that he's self-sufficient, that he's good enough. Or perhaps if there's just one more thing that he lacks, which Jesus just tells him, then he's in the clear, then he's good enough. But he's, he's dead wrong. And friends, do you know what's more dangerous than being in danger? Being in danger while thinking you're safe. It's like living in Pompeii when Mount Vesuvius is about to erupt. And Jesus knows this. And he will make it crystal clear to him by giving him a severe requirement, a severe entrance fee. In Mark's account, it says he looks at him with love. And, and very often, when, when Jesus, because Jesus loves us, uh, he rips the band-aid to expose the spiritual cancer. Verse 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. This was his Achilles heel, his riches. The problem wasn't that he possessed riches. The problem was that riches possessed him. He broke the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Money was his God. And Jesus specifically advises him. I don't think he does this for everyone, but he specifically advises him like one would advise an alcoholic. Get rid of it. Get rid of all of it. Cold turkey. Come clean. And then come Follow me. Your riches in heaven will be greater, far surpassing anything on earth. And notice, for the first time, Jesus is not simply deflecting him, but he's offering him a glimmer of hope. How does he respond? Verse 23. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. The rich ruler walks away very sad. Other translations say sorrowful. Now, he's sad not because he's, he doesn't understand, like he's confused. Actually, for the first time, he does understand. He understands that Jesus is not something you just put on your shelf. He's realized that Jesus is everything, and everything else has to be secondary, he realized that, that he is the most important thing. But now he's sad because he realized he's not as good as he thought. He realized that he loved his riches more than he loved God. And sadder still, he's not able or willing to do anything about it. And perhaps in self-pity, he thinks to himself, at least I have my riches. And he walks away, sorrowful, full in his pockets, empty in his heart. The rich young ruler's problem is our problem today. Self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. And it expresses itself in, in two ways. Those who trust in their good works and those who trust in their good things. The first one is good works. I would say every religion in the world today, except Christianity, would fit this mold. If you do X, Y, and Z amount of good works, you'll be saved. But notice the effort, the work, it's always dependent on you. You pull yourself from your own bootstraps. You climb your way to heaven. You build Babel. You, you, you. It's a man-centered religion. 
And it doesn't even have to be an organized religion. It could be giving back lunches, sorry, excuse me. It could be giving back lunches to the homeless. It could be uh, virtue signaling on Facebook. If, if you do these things to justify yourself, to make yourself feel better, you are under this delusion. The second form of self-sufficiency, and I think Jesus really zones in on this one, uh, is, is the trust in good things. Now hear me out. There's nothing inherently wrong with money. You, money is good. Uh, money is not evil. The problem is the love of money. It's thinking money can buy you happiness. And this idol, it can, and look, it can look different from person to person. You don't have to be the rich young ruler to trust in money. In fact, you can be poor, and you can spend what little you have scratching away lottery tickets. Or you can be rich through ill-gotten means by swindling and, and thievery. Or you could be rich through honest hard work, diligence, intelligence, while contributing to society. If you think that these riches will make you happy, you're under this deception, you're under this delusion. Money is your God. And this answers part of the question, the big question we had today. Why does Jesus reject the rich young ruler? Because he trusted in his good works and his good deeds. Friends, my challenge is this. What do you put your trust in? And what do you hope? Don't put your trust in good works. Don't put your trust in good things. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We can't make it without him. Uh, and, and things won't bring you lasting happiness. Don't be possessed by your possessions. Trust in something else. And we'll find out. Verse 24. We'll find out later. Verse 24. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I said that you can be poor and still trust in riches, but it seems like being rich doesn't do you any favors. In fact, if anything, it's a greater temptation. But don't think that this applies only to the rich. Consider that living in Canada, we are all relatively rich. In fact, we have things a rich young ruler would envy today. Our quality of life is amazing. We have fast food restaurants and flushing toilets. He didn't have those. 25. No? Yeah, yeah, 25. Um, indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. You see here? Jesus paints an impossible picture. It's, it's, it's the idea of the largest animal in that culture going through the eye of a needle. It's one of the smallest things to go through. Okay? And, and just so you're aware, in terms of physics, that's impossible. And impossible is the point. A rich person or any person, to be honest, in their natural state of being, lives in self-sufficiency. Which makes me want to revisit another question I asked earlier. Will riches bar us from entering the kingdom of heaven? No, not necessarily. Abraham, King David, Cornelius, Lydia the merchant, they were all wealthy and they were loved by God and used powerfully by him. Zacchaeus was rich, and he's from the next chapter, and he's loved and called by God. Being rich doesn't prevent you from being Christian. There are many wonderful Christians who are used wonderfully by him. God sometimes blesses them and uses them. Again, the problem is when you trust in your wealth. Verse 26. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? The people are shocked by Jesus' teaching. 
They were looking at the outward appearance, and the rich young ruler had a very impressive resume. In fact, in that culture, the assumption was, if you were rich, you were rich because of God's blessing. So if not this rich young ruler, who can be saved? And this is the question we're asking as well. If self-sufficiency is rejected, who then does Jesus receive? Let's jump back to verse 15. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place their hands on him. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. Here we have the soon-to-be king, presumed, a powerful future figurehead being swarmed by parents throwing their children at him. I mean, this speaks volumes about Jesus' character. If anything, he was approachable. Some people just give off that vibe. The parents knew, the children knew, he was good with kids. And as a side application, I think that's something we should be too. We should be kind to children. But the, dis the, the disciples rebuke the parents. Now, I don't think they're child-hating monsters. I think they were well-intentioned enough. I mean, did Jesus really have time to babysit? Perhaps he had to attend to some rich young ruler or important person. And, 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 and truly, like, spending time with people takes energy. So to save them from, fatigue, uh, from people fatigue, uh, which is real, they shooed away the kids. But Jesus stops them. And other accounts, he even rebukes them. And, and he says, verse 16, But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. The disciples misunderstood. The children, the little children, were precisely the type of people that Jesus welcomes in. Now, I believe a, a small part of the reason is because children are naturally trusting, even in, in spiritual matters, not because of ignorance, but because of instinct. Not because it's something they lack, but it's because they have something that older people have lost. They know how to believe. They are not jaded with cynicism that comes with world-wearying experience. They possess awe and wonder. It makes them ask the big questions that the older people gave up on. Barna, um, the leading website of Christian American statistics states, nearly half of all Americans accept Jesus Christ as their savior before reaching the age of 13. I remember I was doing door-to-door -door evangelism and, 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 the, and these atheist parents with embarrassed looks on their faces admitted that their two children were fervently Christian because of stubborn grandpa. And, and, and when the children heard, they, they, they happily admitted it. One was like, I, I used to believe in God, but now I really believe in Jesus. And it was, it was awesome. And so as a side application, uh, I want to say, friends, when we minister to children, know that this is a noble cause. Sunday school is essential. When we get it back, it's, it's essential. You are doing a work with dignity. Hold yourself in that way. It should be something bathed with prayer. It's hard work. It's, it takes thought and care. And don't underestimate children, because Jesus didn't underestimate children. He welcomed them. But I believe the primary reason why Jesus receives the little children is because they are naturally dependent. In fact, they're, they're utterly dependent. In contrast, like a mother turtle, will lay her eggs on the beach, and boom, she's gone. Let them fend, let them hatch and fend for themselves. But, but, but a child, no, they, they need love and attention. It, in psychology today, uh, in, in the, an article they wrote called Touching Empathy states, babies who are not held, nuzzled, and hugged enough can stop growing. And if the situation lasts long enough, even die. A baby is dependent. 
A baby is not saying to his mom, um, I can't wait to move out. I can't take it anymore. A baby is crying because it wants its mommy's attention. And in a sense, that's the quality God desires. Natural trust and dependence. And then furthermore, Jesus flips the script and says, not only does he receive children, but unless you were like a children, unless you were like a child, he won't receive you. It says in verse 17, Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. You see that? We have to be like children. We should echo King David in Psalm 31 verse 2 when he says, I am a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. A weaned child is, 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 is a child that moves from, from breastfeeding to other forms of nourishment. The child is no longer vitally dependent on the mother, and yet the child still clings. I see my mom, so I remember when I was a child, I would get stuck on my bed um, just because, and could I get myself out? Yep. Would I cry out to my mom for help? Yep. I remember when um, every night I would ask my mom to tuck me in. Did I need to get tucked in? Nope. Would I go to sleep without it? Nope. I needed that. I wanted it. Okay? And in the same way, that's how we must be with God. Trusting and dependent. But unlike my childhood example, uh, we truly, deeply need him. Without him, we are stuck. Apart from him, it's impossible to be saved. And this answers the second part of my big question. Why does Jesus receive the children? Because Jesus saves those who trust and depend on him. Now, let me restate the big question altogether with the answer. Why does Jesus reject the rich young ruler but receive the little children? Because Jesus saves those who trust and depend on him, not those who trust in their good works or their good things. That's the main point. Let me repeat it. It's important. Because Jesus trusts those, or G Jesus, because Jesus saves those who trust in him, not those who trust in their good works or their good things. Friends, don't, don't trust in foolish things. Trust in Jesus. Lay down your self-sufficiency. Like a child, depend on him. Because Jesus is worthy. He's trustworthy. As it says in Luke chapter 18, verse 27, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And so now, let me show you why we can trust in Jesus. Let's jump to verse 20, or 31 to 34. And I'll read. Jesus took up the twelve aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them. They did not know what, they were, what he was talking about. Here is the third and final time that um, Jesus predicts, predicts his death. Um, uh, and still, the disciples didn't understand any of it. Its meaning was hidden from them. But... Its meaning is not hidden from us. We know what happened. We know what happened on Calvary. Instead of being crowned as king of Jerusalem in pomp and circumstance, instead of being seated on the throne in glorious riches, he was crucified on a wretched cross. All his possessions taken. He was stripped naked to the skin. By his outward appearance, he was exposed. 
They looked at him, and they mocked his sad and sorrowful state. But what they did not know, to the surprise and shock, <laughs> was that all along, he was God's chosen. He was the king of Jerusalem, king of the whole world, mind you, and that this was all the father's plan. Like a trusting and dependent son, he followed his father's will. He followed his will. He emptied himself. He humbled himself even to death on a cross. In spite of being the only one good. No, because he was the only one good. He took our place on that cross where we belong. He took our punishment. He bore our shame. So anyone who goes to Jesus, rich or poor, man or woman, boy or girl, young or old, may be completely cleansed of their sins. They may be justified, not because of what they do, but because of what Christ has done. God will look at their hearts, as he's always done, but this time he will say, my son, my daughter, welcome. And they will be received into the kingdom of heaven. They will inherit eternal life. They will know true happiness. This is my friends. This, this is why Jesus is, is trustworthy. Although, salva although salvation was impossible by man, it has been made possible through God. And so, what are you waiting for? Lay down all you have and, and follow him. You will not fail to receive many times in this age and in the age of, to come eternal life. There's a quote I like to finish uh, by Jim Elliott. He is a person who gave everything he had uh, to, to follow Christ. He, he, had a, uh, he had a really cool story. Him, his wife Elizabeth Elliott decided to go... Um, uh, to, um, ooh, uh, the Orkai tribe, Orkai tribe, which is a savage tribe, and to minister to them. He gave everything, his, his whole life, life his well-being in, in America to go there, only to get stabbed to death, only to get stabbed to death by the very people he was trying to minister to. And it was a sad story. And yet, two years later, that story would be on New York Times. Why? Because his wife, Elizabeth Elliot, would go there, and that entire tribe would get saved. They would all know Jesus. And Jim's Elli Jim Elliot's treasures would be laid in heaven. And there's this quote that he used to say, which I want to share to you today. He is no fool to give up what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord God, for this privilege to speak your word. Would we not trust in our riches, not trust in our good works, not be self-sufficient, but lay that down so that we may come to you you are enough. You are good enough. And you can save us. You're more than enough. With God, anything is possible. Thank you that your son not only died for us, but he rose again. So that if we identify with him, we may live just like he did. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Truly, Jesus paid it all. There's nothing we can do to earn anything from him, to earn his favor, to earn his salvation. It's all Jesus. Let's sing together. I hear the again. Savior say, my strength in 
Stand together and sing the blessing. Be gracious to you, Lord. Turn. 
his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand Just a reminder again, for those of you who are in the building with us, after the benediction, I will be dismissing row by row. So listen for your instructions and don't leave until I tell you you can, okay? Um, let's bring in the benediction for everyone uh, from Psalm 72 once again. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel and, we can add, of the church, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. May God bless you this week. You can have a seat if you're in here with us.